All right, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right, thank you. Today we're gonna to be talking about, I wanna start off by talking about a modern day diamond heist. Now, what might come to mind is a couple of guys knocking over an armored car, or perhaps someone a little more industrious digging a tunnel underneath a bank and coming up underneath, right? But I'm talking about a modern day diamond heist. This is the guy, he's sitting at home in front of his computer, and he's on an online store that sells diamonds. And he fills the shopping cart up with, say, $10,000 worth of diamonds, and as he's going through the checkout, he pays for a $5 bottle of jewelry cleaner. And he convinces the store that he's paid in full for his $10,000 worth of diamonds. Now, I don't know about you, I, I watch movies and I see guys are usually using Linux, these hackers, and they're, and they're like, oh, I just owned all the signals in San Francisco, right? And it's so fantastical, it's so out there that it's hard to believe that that could possibly be true and this attack I'm talking about, this diamond heist attack, seems almost like it, it couldn't be possibly real. Like, could a store really be tricked into paying for, taking a payment of $5 for thousands of dollars worth of diamonds? The answer is, of course, yes. And we're gonna learn about it later. So today, I'm gonna be talking about how to protect your online stores from people who would prefer to shop for free. My name's Bill Corey. I'm a security engineer at PayPal. I have with me today Harry Zhu, he's, he's up here. He's an integration engineer. I, I suspected when I was putting this talk together, but by the end, you may have for your own online store integration questions, you know, like, should we be doing it this way? And I wanted someone here who had lots of experience. He's been doing it for six years, a complete expert. He's the best we got. And so he's gonna come up later at the end to answer your integration questions. So, my goal today is not really to teach you how to do these attacks. My goal today is for you to leave here feeling very scared and going back and seeing, hey, does my online store, is, is it vulnerable to these attacks? Because as you can imagine, it's financially devastating, right? This could leave your store with massive, massive losses and it would be hard to track them down. I mean, think about the diamond store. So it looks at its invoice and it's like, well, we had this sell, they paid in full. They had this sell, we paid in full. The attacker, right, the attackers, it shows that it was paid in full. How are they gonna track that, that down? How are they gonna know? When are they gonna find out, right? If they reconcile their books quarterly, maybe. All they'll know is that there's money that's not there and they have diamonds that were shipped off to a dock in Miami, right? So. I want to just throw out there a, a word of warning. I'm encouraging you to test your own websites. I don't want you to test other people's websites unless you have their permission. In a lot of jurisdictions, it's illegal. And more importantly, I don't want you to go early holiday shopping using this information on your limited budget, right? Because if you do, you know, you're probably gonna say, but Bill, you know, these hackers, they don't really get much of a sentence, and if they get caught, right, they, the, you know, as this headline from 2008 says, yeah, you know, you know, great mad hacking skills you got there. But the, the, the environment today is completely different. And I've, I've got this uh, public domain clip art. That's about as good as I could get it. You know, you don't want at 5 a.m. federal agents with guns drawn, busting in your door, taking all your electronic equipment. It's not worth it. So please only test your website, and I strongly encourage you to do that, but don't test anybody else's. All right, so with that housekeeping out of the way, our agenda today, I'm gonna to talk about five flaws. This is not all the flaws there are. There's, you know, it could, permutations, there could be millions of them. I'm gonna talk about five, kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. After each flaw, I'm gonna pause briefly to let you ask questions about that particular flaw. We'll probably have time for maybe two questions, maybe three, and then we'll move on to the next flaw. At the very end, I'm gonna bring Harry up and he can answer your integration questions. So I'd ask that you hold those types of questions off until then. And then before we run out of time, I'll have a few final thoughts to send you home with. All right, so our first flaw, this one involves an attacker being able to bypass PayPal entirely, doesn't pay the store, but is able to download a digital good for free. Now, 
in order to kind of get you into the, I, the, the common format throughout today will be, I'll, I'll show you what the store expects to happen, and then I'll go back and show you how the attacker is able to thwart the controls that the store has in place. So in this particular case, there's a buy now button. The, you expect the person to click on it. They go to PayPal to pay for it. And then at the end, they're redirected back to the site to collect their digital good. Now the important thing to realize here is that when the buyer clicks on the buy now button, embedded in that button is a return URL. That tells PayPal where to send the buyer back to after they've paid. And in our older buttons, that return URL is, is available at the point of where the button exists. I will skip that. So what happens with the attacker is he's able to extract that URL at where, where the button is actually at. And then using that return URL, he skips past PayPal and collects his digital good. Now you might ask yourself, well, why did PayPal bill it that way? Originally, we weren't anticipating digital good delivery this way, right? This was so that then someone who buys physical goods, could, the store could say, hey, thanks for that purchase, we'll process your order and send it off to you. With digital goods, you have to be a little more careful, right? Because if you're using that return URL to deliver your digital goods, that's a problem. So, what should a store do that has this particular issue where they have, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute, I'm sorry. So I just wanna show you real quick, this is what the button looks like. <clears throat> You're probably thinking, well, how does he get it out? Because when I look at my button, it doesn't look like there's a return URL in there. It's just a bunch of garbly gook, right? Well, it's, what happens is, is you can actually go and use a plugin called Firebug. It's a plugin for Firefox, and it's a developer's tool, and it lets you see what the browser is actually seeing for the page. And in this case, if you were to look at the button, it's actually a form that submits to PayPal. And in there is this hidden form field called return, and that's where they're actually extracting it. Now, a lot of people would say, well, okay, that's true, but you'd need this tool, and then you'd have to know how to get to it. it seems like a lot of work, and it doesn't seem like my site would be all that vulnerable since it'd be a lot of work, and I don't know that people would go to that much work. The problem is, is in underground forums, they have this really great bookmarklet. And if you have the ability to copy and paste, this little snippet of JavaScript will actually go in on a page that has this type of button, extract the return URL, and send the browser straight there. So now you can allow anybody who knows how to copy and paste to get past PayPal and go straight to the digital good delivery. So what should the star have done? Just if you have the, the situation where you're delivering digital goods and you're using one of our older buttons, please go back to paypal.com and generate a new one. Our new buttons are either encrypted or you have the option of having PayPal host it for you. In both cases, that will thwart the attack because it won't leak this particular return URL. And to give you an idea, I have with me uh, an example of what an encrypted button at the HTML source looks like. And I've highlighted the part that has the encrypted string. You can see it's, it's encrypted. It doesn't leak anything. And if you go in with Firebug, it looks identical. There's no change. It's, it's identically where it is. So that's your solution to that particular problem. So again, if you have a store that's using these older buttons that's delivering digital goods, and they're out there, and there's actually Google searches that helps people to find them, then you should go back to PayPal because this will stymie this particular attack. So at this point, I'm gonna pause and hopefully someone who has my microphone for questions, if we have any questions. Do we have any questions? Yeah, up here in the front, please. And I'm gonna ask you to ask questions in the microphone because we're streaming it live and they won't be able to hear you. This can't happen. This can't happen now, can it? Because if you get a PayPal button, the only ones PayPal offers are encrypted. That's right. So if you have a button that you've gotten, I don't know, Harry, do you know when they started encrypting the buttons? Five years ago. Harry says five years ago. So these are for very old sites that are vulnerable to this. And there's, there, believe it or not, they're actually out there in, in high numbers. Okay, we have another question. If the PayPal service on uh, the PayPal side is detecting a non-encrypted request from the merchant, can't you notify the merchant saying use some outdated material, please upgrade? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good suggestion. And, uh, you know, it's something we should consider. I agree. Trying to decide for when we get these uh, redirections from 
the merchant site and it's coming through unencrypted, we should look at informing those merchants. And I'll ask Harry to write that down for me. Thank you. Have another question? Uh, question. Uh, so there is a sunrise button that we see on eBay site uh, with directs you to PayPal. It says continue with PayPal. Is that also vulnerable? So the button that's on the eBay site yeah. that directs the customers to PayPal, I don't have, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that that button's okay. I, I don't know. Harry, do you know? So Harry is saying, since but, he but that is not encrypted, right? Uh, it's, it's using API to use server-side APIs, so it doesn't use, it doesn't expose the return URL on the client side. So what Harry is saying is that it uses Express Checkout and it communicates with PayPal on the server-to-server -server side, so that return URL is not exposed, even though it's not encrypted. All right, that's enough for uh, that's that's all the time we have for these questions. All right, our next flaw, this, one, this one's great. This one's where an attacker is almost bartering with the store. He goes and he says, you know, 10,000 euro, I don't really want to pay that. How about five? And the store's like, okay. So let's look at how this happens. The store sends the buyer to PayPal. PayPal collects their payment, returns the buyer back to the store, and the store confirms that they paid. Right, a pretty standard checkout flow. So what happens with the attacker is when the store sends them first to PayPal, in that request is the amount that the store wants to collect from them. And the attacker is like, well, I'll change this 10,000 euro to five euro. And PayPal says, okay, great. I'll collect five euro from you. He does, PayPal does, sends the buyer, in this case the attacker, back to the store. And the store, what does it do? It confirms that it's been paid. So. What should the store have done? Confirm that not only did it pay, but the, you should have confirmed that the amount that paid was what you were expecting. And related to that, you should also check that the currencies match, right? Because if the currencies don't match, if I'm expecting 10,000 euro and I get $10,000, well, $10,000 isn't worth 10,000 euro. And an attacker's probably gonna pick a currency that's worth even less, right? 10,000 pennies, although pennies isn't currency. So the lessons from here is you gotta make sure that the amount that you want is the amount that you got, and that the currencies match so that you're not with this mismatch of currencies. And this is gonna be a common theme for the rest of the flaws is this constant validation of things you know versus things you get. So I know that's kind of a fast one. Do we have any questions about this particular attack? We need the microphone, please. We have a question up here in the front or near the front. He's, can you, the person who has a question, can you raise your hand? He's, he's looking for you, there we go. Do they just change the, the price and the form that it gets submitted? Okay. Same thing, so if you have a clear text form, then it's all in the browser in the clear, so they just change the form, repost the form. If you get an encrypted button, then uh, obviously it's not there. If you get a hosted button, it's only a serial uh, a seri uh, a number. Uh, and then the price is not in the clear. Okay. And I should probably point out that all these flaws we're talking about today do exist in real, either real websites, real commerce platforms, or real checkout systems that are being used by merchants all across the internet. These are not like theoretical, eh, you might be able to do it this way. These are actually real. All right, we'll move on. Thanks, Harry. So this third flaw, this one involves, this particular flow, the merchant actually does a good job and checks that the price matches. Like I wanted 10,000 euro, I got 10,000 euro. So in this particular case though, uh, the, the attacker is constrained by that. He has to make sure that whatever he's, whatever he's buying, all subsequent free transactions, match that initial amount. So he can either mix and match and carefully get it so that the prices match, or he can just simply do the same cart. So he gets five TVs, he has a, he'll get another cart of five TVs. And let's take a look at how it's supposed to work. So the store sends the buyer to PayPal, 
And then PayPal, what's going to do is it's going to collect the money from them, and then on the back end, it's going to communicate to the store directly using what's known as an instant payment notification, IPN. And that IPN tells the store the transaction ID and how much money and, and, and the currency and, and basically tells the store, yes, uh, we have received this payment. Then PayPal then will send the buyer to the store and the store will confirm that he's paid. And it's going to confirm, in this particular case, it confirms that, you know, that the IPN is valid, that the, um, the order ID matches what is supposed to be there, so the attacker can't monkey with that and confirms that the price, right? Confirms the price is okay. So the attacker has some now, some constraints and limitations. So what does the attacker do? Well, the attacker, when he's going from the store to PayPal, there's an IPN handler field, and that handler field tells the PayPal, hey, when I, this payment's completed, send a notification to this particular URL. Normally it's the merchant, but in the case of this attack, the attacker makes it point to his own server. And then the attacker is going to capture that IPN on his own server, and he's going to use it later. Now, the important thing, too, to note is that the order ID, he changes it to null, and that'll become more clear in a moment. And so he goes through, he can go through the rest of the, the flow to collect his real purchase, which he probably used with the stolen credit card. But now he's going to go back through the flow again. And this time what's going to happen, he's going to skip past PayPal and he's going to pretend to be PayPal and send the store that IPN notification so that when his browser shows up at the store, it knows that he's already paid, right? Now, this particular solution has a, has a critical flaw, which is it does confirm the order ID, except for when it's null. When it's null, for whatever reason, it was programmed like if I get a null order ID through this particular interface, then don't check the order ID. So the amounts match, the IPN's valid, this order's paid, this attacker just made off with whatever goods. So if he bought five TVs originally and then he fills his cart up again with five TVs, there it goes out the door. The store could limit, obviously, the amount of damage if it limits the IPN to just one. And he can keep repeating. So, so this is, uh, so the solution, what should the store do in this case is it should limit that the IPN is only used once because it's, you shouldn't see the same transaction ID multiple times. And if the store kept track of them and realized it had already seen this one and accepted it as payment once, then it would have prevented this particular attack. And the lesson here is that IPN, that instant payment notification, has a lot of different, a lot of detail in it, right? So it has the payment status, it tells who received the payment, it has a transaction ID, it has the currency, it has the amount of the, the payment, and the store already knows what all of those should be for this transaction. And if the store verifies all of those, that they all match up, then you know that's a, it's a legitimate transaction. If, if for whatever reason you get an error and it doesn't match up, you should have some process where it kicks that order into some manual verification system where then you can say, hey, I, I got some weird order, things didn't match up, let me manually process it so that you can catch these and understand there's people maybe trying to, you know, steal from your site. I'm kind of going fast, so I'm, I apologize. Is, is there questions about this particular one? And if you can raise your hand, the guy with the mic will... Uh, Isn't transaction ID generated by PayPal? It is. So right. the merchant doesn't know what the transaction ID is. The merchant has to say, have I seen that transaction ID ever in the past? Yes. So if you see the same IPN being replayed at you, so you would uh, check whether you have received this before. If you received it before, so it was for the previous order, not for this new order. But, but that would mean the merchant has to go through all 390,000 transactions they have in the database to see if this one transaction ID has ever shown up before. It would be a query on the transaction ID, so you just do a query. Now, in addition to doing that, wouldn't it make sense for the merchant to send an order identifier that they generate and look to see that it's that one hasn't been transact hasn't been processed before. 
uh, that can work too. Uh, although, if depending on how the water ID is being sent, uh, if you're not matching that water ID uh, correctly, or if that water ID is also subject to tempering, then the attacker can also temper that water ID. And it all comes back to don't send un unencrypted. It'd be stupid to do it. And uh, keeping the water ID on the server side, so keep as much information on the, uh, of the state on the server side and not expose it to the browser either in a cookie or in the query string. Thanks. Yeah. All right. We got one more. We'll take one more question and then uh, we'll move on. Can you, can you? Okay. There's one in the back. Hey, Vijay. Oh, hello. Um, well, just following up on that, though, there are, there would be times where you might have instant payment notification happen more than once because sometimes on my uh, my phone, you know, it, it doesn't go through for whatever reason, or there's a glitch in the the phone service or whatever method. So, how do you distinguish between good duplicate instant payment notifications and bad duplicate instant payment notifications? Uh, duplicates are fine. Uh, duplicates it depends on how you handle the duplicates. If you receive the duplicate, it comes and it's the for the previous order that you already mark it as paid, and it's marked as paid. You just you just don't receive a duplicate IPN and treat it as the IPN for the new order. Okay. So if you get it once and you once it's canceled, then if you get another one, and you uh, just drop it, you ignore it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Yeah, we'll have more time at the end. I just want to make sure we get through all the flaws and then we'll have time at the end and we can talk about any of these flaws that you have. And I'm very happy I brought Harry because I, I knew you'd have very technical questions that I may not know all the answers to. All right, this next flaw, you'll recognize this one. This is the one that I talked about at the very beginning, which is the diamond heist, right? Where you buy a low cost item and you end up well with all these thousands of dollars of diamonds. So we're gonna run through the flow real quick. PayPal collects the payment. The store on the back end realizes that this, it's been paid and marks the session as paid. PayPal returns the buyer to the store. The store, what it's gonna do when the buyer comes back, it's going to cryptographically sign the order ID. It does that because it doesn't want an attacker to mess with it and change the value. This is the way it knows that on the final page, when it's doing the final checkout and the cleanup, that it can validate that the session that this, that this particular buyer is in has paid and also that the order ID has been cryptographically signed. So it knows what, you know, this session's paid for this particular order. And in this particular case, the store's done a phenomenal job making sure that the attacker can't change any of the values. So it, you might be thinking to yourself, well, if the attacker can't change anything, how's the attacker going to you know, defraud this particular store. Well, the attacker does something really clever. The attacker uses the store against itself. So this is how it does it. He gets two browsers open, and in those two browsers, he has two shopping carts. In the first browser, he goes and he shops for all the high-cost things that he wants. So with our original example, $10,000 worth of diamonds, and he puts them in there. And then he skips past PayPal and he jumps to the part of the flow where the store sign, cryptographically signs the order ID. What he's gonna do is he's gonna capture that and then abort that particular flow. So now he has a cryptographically signed order ID from the store for his cart that has the high cost items, the diamonds. Now he goes in with his other browser, with his other shopping cart, and he buys that $5 bottle of jewelry cleaner. Right, but this time he's actually gonna go through the flow, he's gonna go to PayPal, and he's gonna pay for the $5 bottle of cleaner. And then PayPal will return him back to the store. The store will sign his order ID. But on the final step, he takes that order ID out and puts in the high cost order ID. So when the store goes to do its final verifications, you remember this is the low cost flow. So this session, the store knows he's paid. And on the final, when it says, oh, which order ID is this for? It's the high cost order ID. And the store knows that the order ID hasn't been mucked with because it's been cryptographically signed. So our, our clever thief now has just walked off with thousands of dollars of diamonds for the price of a $5 bottle of jewelry cleaner. And of course he can repeat this as often as he wants. So 
What should the store have done? He, the store should have verified that the order ID and the session were associated. It should have associated at the beginning and then verified that they are still associated at the end. So if it gets an order ID, but it's not associated with this particular session that the buyer's in, it should have then kicked that one out, right? Put it into the manual process. So, and then this is cross system champering. So some lessons for this is that you should always maintain state service side as much as you can, what Harry was saying. And most importantly, if you have all these elements and they're supposed to all be related, transaction IDs or if they're tokens, the order IDs, the sessions, if you know they're supposed to be associated, then you should check that they're associated. And if they're not, then flag it as suspicious and manually process it. Any questions about this one? Did I go too fast? Sorry. I'm trying to keep it high level, but then it goes faster. Hey, you said something that sort of blew past me at the, at the beginning. In the high cost flow, mm -hmm. the attacker gets the encrypted ID by skipping past the PayPal steps. Yes. How do you do that part? So in reality, what would happen is an attacker would probably go to the store and make a, a full purchase of a very low cost item, see how the entire flow works. So then the attacker knows that after PayPal, I always go to PayPal return dot, you know, whatever it is, uh, HTML. And he knows that at that step, the storage and cryptographically signs an order ID and then redirects to the final checkout page. And so in doing the redirect, one of the parameters is this order ID that's been cryptographically signed. So the attacker in reality then, when he wants to complete his attack, he already kind of, he already knows each step. He knows which uh, pages the, the whole flow works with, and then he's able to, you know, jump past PayPal and go straight to the page that he wants to go to. That so basically sense. the attacker studies a flow that mm -hmm. includes PayPal. That's figures right. out what the step right after PayPal looks like, mm -hmm. and then does another flow starting with that step. Yeah, and so is there no way to make that step obscure or not enterable oh. without the PayPal process ahead of it? Oh, certainly. So, yeah. So this is a particular commerce platform, and this is the way it does it. In, you know, it would be great if they rewrote it so that you don't have that two steps at the very end where it signs an order ID, then pushes it off to another page that does the final cleanup. So it's really about how everything's coded. And, and the reason I chose these real world examples is because these are just flaws in the way it's been implemented. And there's probably some underlying architectural reason why it's done the way it's done. Um. Hmm. Go ahead. Okay, do we have any other questions? I'll take one more. Oh, we have another one at the front. When you refer to session in that example, is that session stored in the browser, like cookie or something? Uh, yeah, so what I'm referring to as session is the state maintained on the server side. So the store has on its side, you know, on the client side, there's a session cookie of some sort, and on the back end, there's some transient storage that says, this session ID means that it's this order ID with this cart, and it should be this total amount. That's what I mean by the session. So when the store marks the session paid, it's really marking on the server side that the session's been recorded as paid. It's a way to protect the attacker from changing anything on the client side. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, great. Okay. All right. So this this last one's my my favorite. Um, it's uh, actually we'll both through it pretty fast. It, there's not a lot to it. Uh, it's my favorite because it's actually an online only, well known store that was susceptible to it, and it was the researchers from Microsoft and Indiana University who discovered it and they fixed it since then. But it just it just shows you that even the big guys can make some simple mistakes. So. How does this work? You can, let's walk, let's walk through the flow. So PayPal collects the payment. It tells the store on the back end, hey, uh, this, this token has been paid, so it marks this token paid. Store returns the buyer back to, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the PayPal returns the buyer back to the store. And then the store says, oh, uh, let's see, you got this token, let me see. Oh yeah, you paid, right? And having gone through all those other ones, you probably already see what the problem is, right? Tacker buys a low-cost item. 
He goes through, he says, okay, I'll pay for it. And then before that last step, when he goes to do the final checkout back to the store, he collects that token value because it's, it's in with the request back to the store. And he takes a copy of it. Then he goes back in and he gets a cart full of whatever he wants, skips past PayPal, he knows the point at which he's going to jump back to the store, and he returns to it the paid token, right? So he takes out whatever token it was and puts in the paid token. Now, the store then says, okay, here's this order, and I have this token, let's look it up. Oh, it's been paid, great. So now that this order has been paid, that means that the attacker now can repeat this process without having to go back to buy anything ever again and can just fill his card up and check out. Fill his card up and check out. All for free. I, as part of my job at, at PayPal, you know, I'm, I'm paid to be paranoid and I have a lot of exposure to various things. This class of flaws is what would keep me up at night if I had an online store because the potential for it to financially destroy whatever merchant it is, is enormous, right? And if you don't have the processes in place to catch these type of attacks, you know, it could just be devastating. So in this particular case, the store should have verified that the token matches the session. Again, it's about making sure that all the elements that you know about the transaction all match up and they all make sense. And in this particular case, you know, Make sure the token's attached to the session and don't allow the token to be reused, right? Kind of similar to what the other ones were. So we'll go ahead and take some questions on this one. I, this one was a simple one. But I, I like it because it's a very big online store and it's kind of a simple mistake in a way. Any questions? All right, well. So, okay, so I wanna finish up kind of builds on what I was already saying. These flaws you might not be able to find. And you can look for them and you can test for them, but you may not be able to find them. However, what you can do is make sure that someone doesn't come back to your store day after day, week after week, and just is shipping themselves free goods. And so my suggestion to you, if you take nothing else from this particular talk with you when you go home, is to set up some sort of reconciliation process where you take, here's all the money I got in my PayPal account today, Here's all my transactions, all my receipts and invoices, and match them up. If they don't match up, then you know you got a problem, right? It could be someone internally siphoning money, or it could be one of these flaws, one of these integration or checkout flaws, where it's very easy to make simple mistakes and have it be catastrophic. And depending on your site and you know, your level of transactions you have, you, you can figure out how often you want to reconcile it, but I wouldn't recommend doing it quarterly or monthly you want to do it rather often. So you can catch it soon and stop these types of attacks. So I want you to walk out with that. Now, I've, I've glossed over you know, the details of these on purpose because I wanted to make it more an awareness campaign. I wanted you to come out of here thinking, oh God, I, I gotta really look for these. If you want the details, the, the first resource up there is a paper from Microsoft and Indiana University, and it goes into exquisite detail about the text I talked about today and additional ones. There's even more that they actually talk about in their paper. It's really, really good read. It's very technical, so give yourself plenty of time to read through it and understand it and work through the examples. Hopefully my presentation will at least give you some idea you know, of what, what they're actually talking about. The other two are, in case you use those APIs, I just want to point out those APIs actually do have some best practices and some security considerations in them. So if you're using them, you might want to go back and reread that section just to double check, because there are some good, uh, there is some good security information in those. And then because I work for PayPal Security, I want to make sure that uh, if you have any sort of security concerns or issues with PayPal, that you're able to let me know and let us know. Uh, and so for the, for, for the spoof at paypal.com, that's if you get a fake email and probably everybody in here has had at least one, right? Go ahead and uh, send the email along with the headers. The headers let us know where it came from to spoof at paypal.com and we'll go ahead and investigate and track that down. The leak credentials is usernames and passwords for PayPal users, and you can send those to credit paypal.com either if you have them or if there's a link, like if it's on Pastebin, just go ahead and send it to there. Now, I wanna warn you though, 
you may be tempted to help us out and say, well, I don't know if this is real. Maybe I should just verify that this isn't just bogus data because I don't want to send them, I don't want to send PayPal bogus data. The problem is if you go to paypal.com and you look at, oh, okay, here's someone's stolen credentials and you type them in, we can't tell between you as a helper and you as someone who's trying to break into one of our uh, users' accounts. And I don't want you to get in trouble. So just send them to us. We have a whole team. They will look at them and they'll take care of them. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped past the last one there. So site security, that's at paypal.com. That's if you have any other concerns, uh, security concerns about APIs or site. If there's a phishing site, you come across a fake PayPal site that's trying to collect credentials, you can send it there and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. And now I'm gonna bring Harry up. I, I, was, I don't know if there's a lot of integration questions, but if you do, Harry's up here to help answer those. And of course, I can answer questions about the security aspects of everything I've talked about. Any questions? All right, well, oh, oh we have one in the front. Well, you've given me religion about uh, balancing my PayPal account, but of course the orders are coming in hot and heavy, so when I take a look at my invoice list and jump over immediately to PayPal, it's not gonna match because in the past few seconds, a few more orders have come in. So what I like to do is have a cron job that runs at two o'clock in the morning and peels that data off my account at PayPal to match up against my internal books. Is there an API that lets me see my recent transactions on the PayPal site? Uh, there are transaction search, uh, there are uh, get transaction details, so all those APIs will help you. Uh, if you have, uh, you internally generate uh, invoice IDs and then you can search on invoice IDs, search on each invoice ID, make sure that they match, make sure PayPal has, uh, has it in pay on the PayPal side. Uh, there is also online reports, so you can go into PayPal on, on the history side. You can download them into Excel and, and do the matching uh, on a daily basis or hourly basis. Thanks. Any last thoughts, questions? All right, well, I'm gonna wrap it up then. Oh, we have one other one. So you talked about the you talked about the frauds. Uh, are there any issues related to the funding source inside PayPal? I mean, can those be spoofed? Like credit card or the bank details that are given when, when, when we integrate with PayPal. Uh, so those are the funding sources which, from which the money goes out. So can there be any spoofing around that? Uh, adding fake credit cards, there certainly can be uh, can be a case an attacker opens a PayPal account and adds a stolen credit card to it uh, until that that credit card is reported as stolen or until uh, uh, another user notifies PayPal that uh, the credit card is being stolen, then it's theoretically a certain impossibility. Are, are you asking if an attacker can actually change the data that you receive that says, oh, I didn't pay with my checking account like this says I paid with my credit card? Uh, well, actually, I'm, I mean, that's a high level question. So, any spoofing related to that? Yeah. So, that, that was one of the answers. Yeah, theoretically, yes. So, if I learn of somebody's uh, bank account, I can add them to, to my PayPal account. But PayPal does a random deposit verification. So, chances of stolen bank accounts are probably uh, uh, not that high. Uh, but for stolen credit cards, if you get hold of stolen credit cards, uh, again, theoretically, it can be added to a PayPal account. Uh, but at the same time, many merchants take credit cards straight. So adding the, pay adding the credit card num fake credit card number into the PayPal account would be an extra step. So most attackers would just use those stolen credit cards straight. One, one more question. So, so in all the five flow, uh, the flaw cases that we saw, uh, is there a possibility that the attacker uh, gets into the PayPal account information for any of the buyers and then uh, change the credit card details or anything around that? Uh, via phishing, certainly. Uh, so if that's why we have uh, the email alias for, uh, for phishing. So if somebody fished out uh, the PayPal buyer's credential, they can use uh, that buyer to buy items from you and then have that uh, victim pay, uh, use that funding source to pay, and then ship to their own address. Uh, that's certainly theoretically possible.
Okay, we have a question in the back. Just checking the time. We're good. <clears throat> I'll actually go back. Um, my question is about the digital delivery or digital uh, downloads. How can we, you know, detect frauds on that? Digital goods uh, delivery? Yes. <coughs> okay. emails or. You want to answer or you want me to? Um, you, you can go. So what, what James is saying for those that are watching from home is that when you do your digital goods delivery, every URL should be unique for that particular purchaser. Because once they've downloaded the digital goods, you want to make that, that URL that's unique for them, you want to disable it because you don't want them to keep coming back and downloading it again and again. Or more importantly, you don't want them sharing it with friends and family. Hey, go check out this. How can we make sure like the purchaser is actually who who they are? Like if they're not using fraud, fraud, uh, credit cards, you know, other you know, because it's shipping address or uh, we don't know if it's verified or not. Since we, we're sending okay. it through, email. so the question is, how do you know if the credit card isn't stolen? And that that's more on our traditional fraud side. I don't. Yeah, that by integration, you will never know. You will never know if somebody fished out a buyer's credential and used that buyer to download digital goods from you. Then there is no way that you can prevent it uh, from happening. Uh, only PayPal's fraud tool will uh, will detect it. Uh, if somebody uh, you, uh, stole a credit card, they can open a PayPal account and use that stolen credit card. Until that stolen credit card is detected, uh, that that buyer account has password because the attacker just created that uh, that account. So they can certainly use that account to do uh, digital downloads. If you're talking about um, buyer being bad, then there's not much you can do about it. Uh, here in this, uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, we're talking about the integration flaws in that the, the, the attacker does not need a bad buyer account. The attacker is using a very good uh, buyer account uh, they own. They're paying the $5 and getting $10,000 worth of items. They're paying uh, $5 once and then getting uh, items loaded uh, again and again and again. We have a question up here in the front. Yeah, and we'll, uh, okay, our mic's coming. We'll make this the last question because we're almost out of time, and I do have a, last, a couple last thoughts that I want to get out. So, does the merchant let you know that it was fraud on the back end, and then you, what do you do then, or it just happens? So, if the, if the merchant suspects that he has some fraudulent transactions, and, he, and the payment came from PayPal, then he should contact PayPal and let them know that, hey, I saw this activity from this particular uh, email account that's associated with the PayPal, PayPal account, and, and let us know, because then we can open up a fraud investigation and see perhaps this kind of transactions has been going on, and we can work with the merchant. Yeah, definitely. All right. OK. I'm just, like, sorry. So just a last couple closing thoughts as you're about to exit and enjoy the rest of the conference. I want you to leave today. Now that you know about these problems, go back and look for them. More importantly, put in checks and balances into your operational processes so that you can catch these when they're happening versus, you know, oh, I'm closing out my books for the month. And then suddenly it's like, oh, wait, we're missing, you know, $50,000. You don't want that to be your case. And Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate you coming and go prevent your own diamond heist. Thank you very much. Woo!